Hey, bro. Mr. Mayor, council members, let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to gather together in your name. I pray for every one of our community leaders, Father, for our mayor, for our council members, for our city manager, Father, for our fire chief, our police chief, for all of those who serve this community, Father, in so many ways. I pray that you would bless each one of them, that you would give them a heart of leadership, a heart of discernment, that you would give them vision, Lord, your divine imagination for this community, that you would help each one of them to see through your eyes and through your heart every person that makes up Los Baños, Father. They would not distinguish between the rich and the homeless, between the landowner and the immigrant, between the business owner or the laborer, but recognize that every one of them are a part of what makes up this community. And so, Father, give them your heart for them that they would seek justice, that they would love mercy, Father, that they would walk humbly with their God as they serve you in this capacity. So bless us and bless them and be with this time, Father. Make this a time of fellowship, a time of coming together, a time of agreement, a time, Lord, where we can communicate and understand and hear. Give them the humility and the desire to listen to each other, to speak in love, to speak with compassion, and to practice gracious interpretation in all that we do, Father. So bless them, be with them, be with our community. Bless us, Lord. In the name of Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Chief Brain, want to lead us in the pledge? To the Lord, of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. I can have a roll call, please. Here. Here. We have a quorum. Let's move on to item four consideration of the approval of the agenda. Do I have an motion? Councilmember Jones? So moved. Councilmember Lambert? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Let's move on to item five presentations. All right, Dana Rawls. Pretty popular, just gonna point that out. All right, Dana, this is presented to you, our administrative coordinator for the fire department, recognition of your outstanding performance and dedicated service to the city of Los Manos for being named employee of the month, February, 2024. Congratulations. Yeah, Hold it up. All right, let's move on to item six public forum. Members of the public may address the city council members on any item of public interest. So it's within the jurisdiction of the city council includes agenda and non-agenda items. No action will be taken on non-agenda items. Speakers are limited to a five minute presentation. Detailed guidelines are posted on the city council chamber information table. There's an announcement that we did receive one write-in comment that has been received by the city clerk's office and was distributed to city council via email prior to the, to the meeting. And that comment was posted on the city's website for public access. So I'll invite the public to come up. kicked off they, and they look so cute. Uh, my name is Blanche George and I have some fellow elves here for this presentation. Um, you know when we started Halloween, yes I know this is like uh, way past Halloween, um, our dream um, nine years ago was to uh, we had did some dogs for the uh, police department several times. 
And um, our dream was to do this for the fire department, the men and women that constantly, every minute, roll out. Um, it's, we hear it, we respect it, and I know you guys respect it. So we just wanted to take a few, just a few minutes to, to thank our fire department, to thank you for what you do um, for the fire department and the things that you do. We appreciate it, really, truly. Uh, yeah. But the leaders and all the fire individuals, thank you. We really appreciate you guys. It's not an easy job. So what we did do was uh, we, have, we have collected um, these cute little um, Dalmatians. <laughs> and uh, what they are is they're comfort dogs. So when our fire department, um, unfortunately, um, has interaction with the child, they'll have a comfort dog that we will keep providing to help the fire department be able to give comfort to children at the time that they really need it. And so uh, thank you for your, your moment of time, but we Elks are very proud to help support our community, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. The Halloween event was a huge success, yeah. and I was, had the pleasure, and winsome, of course. We were the... Um, co-chairs of the event, and this year I will be, and Winston mm -hmm. will be the chair. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, yeah, we, we took some of the money that we got donated, which it brings tears to my eyes. It was a big turnout. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm very thankful for living here, and, um, and I respect all that you do. I know you guys get a lot of bashing, and um, we are very, very thankful at the Elks uh, for the money that we got and the turnout of the event. It was hugely funny. We had Santa and everything it was great. So this year it's gonna be much bigger. Thank you. Thank you. Don't wanna take up more than our five. Fire chief. <laughs> to what? Fire chief? I'll take Sorry. Thank you. Emotional. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Um, my name is Patricia McCoy from Los Banos. I am here to remind everyone that the Central Valley Honor Flight drive through dinner is on Monday, March 11th at the DES Hall from 4 to 7 p.m. So if you've bought tickets, don't forget to pick them up or your dinners. Um, tickets are $10. You can still get some. I'm selling them. Check out any of the FFA Ag Boosters or any of the veterans. I'm pretty sure that if you don't connect and you want to just show up, I'm sure that they will sell you a dinner. Um, if you don't eat pasta, it is a rigatoni dinner. And if you don't eat pasta, you can donate it or just make a donation for a really worthy cause. So thank you very much. I'm Ann McCauley, local resident. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. The Arbor Day uh, celebrations were fantastic. The breakfast in the morning and uh, the afternoon uh, celebration with all the kids that um, did so well with their uh, with their exhibits and also being able to pick up a, a planting to, to take home. Um, fantastic. And the, the parks are looking fabulous. I live next to uh, or close to College Greens and the, the change that's happening there with new equipment is fantastic. So really appreciate all the people that work at Park and Rec and those that are also installing everything. It looks fabulous. I wanted to uh, respond to something that I heard last week. Greg Hostetler was here. And uh, one of the things that really gets my craw, I live in College Greens. I've been there for over 27 years. And our particular area of College Greens is fantastic. Uh, we've never had issues over all these years, and um, it's just really a, a, a great place to live. It hasn't been degraded like other places might have, have, might have uh, become over the years. But the thing that really irks me is um, the, the new segment, I believe it's called O'Shaughnessy. I didn't follow it from the very beginning, uh, so I don't know if it changed developers or whatever. But the thing that, um, you know, if a developer is going to be proud of their site where they build homes, 
for gosh sakes, the least they can do is put in landscaping, lighting to that entrance on De Anza. Um, I don't, you know, it, whose fault it is that it didn't happen, but I think it falls on the developer to make his lands, his um, project uh, stand out because that's his name, that's his reputation. And the fact that that has been blocked off for people that live in that area and they have to go around on um, scripts uh, speaks volumes. Um, you know, you can shine all you want about all of the um, donations that you make and on and on and on. Well, I think it's time to be philanthropic and get that landscaping lighting in there. I, when it went in, there's a median in between the two lanes, and I thought, surely there'd be some landscape lighting. I can't imagine that a developer would just, you know, book out of there once his houses are built and no landscaping uh, lighting is even in there. It may not have been adequate for everything, but at least it, you would have a demarcation where you exit in or out, especially when it's dark at night. Um, I just think that's, I think that's despicable when a developer, any developer, does not make that whole, their area look smart. Um, one of the things that I have noted, when the credit union uh, built uh, their site on the corner, and by the way, they've done a fabulous job. I think it's fantastic that we don't have anything but that credit union there. Um, we have, I mean, we could have had stores or whatever, but this is, and they built a sidewalk. Whether they had to or not, they built a sidewalk. And to me, if a developer is going to build a piece of part, uh, build anything on the other side of a sound wall, why in the heck can't they build a sidewalk? Never mind that this is state land on a state highway, but that sidewalk speaks volumes for the kids that need to walk in that area. And I just think that should be one more thing. It may not be something that's required of them, but I do think that they need to, it should be something that the city considers, that if they're going to have a sound wall, let's get, the, let's get some sidewalk part of that as well. Um, I just think that it finishes off um, any project, and uh, it just makes it look better in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again, Kathy Ballard. Um, I just have one question. Um, after the incident that happened at Home Depot, um, there was postings on um, the city's face page that were removed. I don't know what that, your guys' I'm sorry, Facebook. Sorry, I only read a page of it. Um, on your Facebook, and then it was deleted, and all the other things in regards to it. My question is, is that people go there, to see what's happening in the city, good, bad, or ugly. Um, and it was removed, and so then it's just a chatter among different people. Um, I don't know, what is our Facebook for if not to inform the citizens of Los Banos if they should be nervous, they live near here, what's going on? Um, that's my only comment. And if you can answer it later, I'd appreciate it, like in your closing statements. I know you can't say anything right now, but I'd appreciate any kind of information in regards to it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council, staff, and public. My name is Greg Hostetler. I would like to talk tonight to City Manager Josh Panero. I want to let you know that I'm less than impressed with your performance, Josh. You've been paid $1.8 million plus a approximately $265,000 salary package, and you're the richest city manager ever to serve in the city of Los Banos with the least amount of experience and least amount of team ad attitude. Your actions and attitude is creating what happens and appears to be a hostile, stressful, and harassing environment towards the city employees and the public. These appear to be a substantial amount of staff being mistreated. 
And now I'm going to talk about your performance. The Anza Way is not being addressed. I got a nasty gram from the city of Los Banos on September, September 1, 2022, after De Anza was open to traffic for more than three years. The nasty gram was requesting an answer to the situation or else. On September 22nd, 2022, we provided a city a multi-page itemized response of the situation on De Anza Way. We again sent a follow-up letter on May 20th, 2023, regarding the same subject. To date, I have not received an answer from the city to either letter. We received an MOU from City Attorney Bill Vaughn on September 13th, 2023. Last year, after you got rehired, I invited you to my office so you and I met and talked about resolving the situation because I was open to helping the city resolve the situation. I said to you, let's get a roundtable meeting with Caltrans, the city engineer, the city council, one or two of them, yourself, my engineers, planning engineers, staff, and work out with people that have the authority to resolve it. And you said, no, you were going to do it yourself. I have not received any information or communication from you, Josh, resolving the situation since that meeting last year or follow-up letters since. I am again going to request that you put together the meeting to get everyone in the room and resolve the situation for the benefit of the city and the community. The city has collected $3,385.85 in traffic fees on every permit at Shaughnessy Village. The city has issued 2,340 permits over the past 10 years, which is about $8 million in traffic and impact fees. Where is the money? I want to talk to you about Shaughnessy Village Park. The city has collected approximately $7,450 per permit for the park acquisition and park development fees, times 151 permits. The city has also collected almost $17 million in the past 10 years for park acquisition development. Where are the parks? Shaughnessy Village has been completed for approximately three years. Councilman Begonia, that's your area. That is your district. What takes so long to get the park built? The city has yet to pay for the land and the improvements that have been done so far on the park, bringing water, electricity, grading, and more. It's time to move forward and resolve the situation. The city doesn't own the land. The next item is the entrance to Vineyard Drive on Highway 165 on the north side of town. The connection has not been completed. It was designed to be built years ago by the city and they collected money on every home to be built there and has yet to be completed. Josh, you need to get the job done because the liability to the city may be in the event that someone in the subdivision over 1,000 homes cannot access the highway in an emergency response to go to the hospital in Modesto, Turlock, Merced, or emergency services, which would be a great disservice if someone died. It was required in a traffic study for safety and traffic flow on every permit. There was a traffic fee paid by the residents and a traffic fee in addition to that of over a million dollars. That subject was complete well over 10 years ago. Councilman Lambert, that's your district. The city has received approximately $10 million in COVID money to spend it on as they wish, as I understand. On anything they wish. I, where is the money going? These people have been waiting. There is a meeting being set up next week with myself, the city attorney, and my legal counsel to move forward and hopefully resolve some of these situations I have been talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Lannis and Council. Chris Santos here representing the office of Congressman John Duarte. Uh, the Congressman was honored to have the opportunity to join uh, Chief Paul Twala and the Los Banos Fire Department for their annual pancake breakfast fundraiser. And the Congressman would also like to wish everyone in this chamber a happy Women's History Month. Congressman Duarte recently led a bipartisan letter to Commissioner Robert Califf of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, encouraging the FDA to reconsider expediently the addition of valley fever to the current list of tropical diseases that qualify for a priority review voucher. Valley fever is an infectious fungal disease that can be severe or even deadly, with approximately 200 deaths occurring each year. 
Given that the vast majority of infections occur in only certain parts of Arizona and California, particularly the southern San Joaquin Valley, the disease is particularly concerning to our constituents in CD13. Nationally, however, valley fever is considered a rare disease. According to the CDC, in 2019, there were 20,000 reported cases of valley fever. As is often the case for rare diseases, there have not been sufficient market incentives to encourage recent development of products for the treatment or prevention of valley fever. Moreover, the off-label use of certain antifungals to combat the disease is associated with various significant adverse effects to health. From our understanding, the FDA should be able to qualify valley fever as part of the tropical disease PRV program due to it being an infectious disease for which there is no significant market in developed nations and its disproportionate effect on poor and marginalized populations. In 2015, the FDA issued an order explaining the factors used to designate diseases for this list. It is our understanding the valley fever prevalence in the United States is below the threshold set by the FDA for this program, which indicates a lack of a significant market to support the development of new treatments and a vaccine, in addition to its disproportionate impacts on marginalized populations, according to data from the CDC and other public health organizations. In light of the current standard of care, there is now a critical need for improved products. Congressman Duarte believes that an incentive in the form of a priority review voucher would provide necessary interest and investment. Accordingly, the Congressman is requesting that the FDA review any and all new information related to valley fever and make a new determination on adding this disease to the PRV program, consistent with congressional direction, so we can stamp out this threat to the health of valley families. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Christopher Lavellia, L-A-V-E-G-L-I-A. I'm with Santos Ford. I'm uh, here to speak regarding the City of Los Banos website. There's currently a listing for Public Works invitation for sealed bids for 24 Suburban and for two Chevy Traverses. Um, <clears throat> I, I feel that appears to me that the city has blackballed me from doing business with the city. Previously, whenever there was a bid on your website, I was emailed by Public Works saying, hey, Chris, there's a bid out, you need to bid on it. There was a bid that I won for a Ford Expedition, and <clears throat> I ordered it, received the purchase order, and in the bid, I put that it would tentatively take 240 to 270 days. And things out of my control, there was an auto worker strike, there was constraints to the supply chain. The vehicle just happened to arrive um, last week. It was canceled on December 7th. So now my question is to the city, how come I'm no longer being afforded bids and notified Another question for the city is, the only dealership in town is a Ford dealership. Why are you bidding Chevrolets? My other question is, um, the last vehicles that I sold to the city of Los Banos, I sold six trucks with utility bodies on them. I won the bid, and I was $18,740.48 cheaper than the out-of-town Chevrolet dealer. And another question I have for the city, does the city still abide to section 3-10.320, uh, local business preference? Is that still a city ordinance? On that bid I won, I didn't need the extra 5% because I won the bid. But, um, <clears throat> and another thing, the police department and the fire department don't do things by sealed bid. The police department did one time on a sealed bid, which I won, and I delivered the vehicle. And recently, the fire department had me, well, he left, price a pickup, and I never heard back. If I got it or not, or if anybody priced against me, I'm, I'm wondering why those entities aren't under sealed bids. And <clears throat> my other question is, are you providing oversight of what's going on on these bids and things? Don't you have a fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayers' money? I, it seems to me it's just, hey, 
you know, I couldn't deliver that vehicle and now I'm blackballed. Like I said, and I have copies of previous emails where they email me saying, hey, we have an invitation to bid. I have a copy of the bid where I put tentative very clearly. And I have the bid results of the six trucks showing that I was a low man and I saved the city money. And now I just, I don't understand why you're not doing business with me anymore, being that I'm local. That's all. Thank you. I'm um, Pastor Raul Granillo with uh, Mercy Springs Church of the Nazarene on the corner of Santa Barbara and Mercy Springs. Um, I just want to let you know that on April 4th, we're going to be having, working with uh, Civic, the Central Valley Immigration Network, and uh, we're going to be having a free workshop that will include um, DACA renewal and citizenship for those who are looking to work on their immigration. We'll have lawyers on site as well as accredited representatives that can help with all of these for, for very little cost. It'll be on a, on a slight scale or even free in some situations, but we just want to make sure that our community has access to these things. So if you know somebody who needs help with any kind of immigration issues, they can reach out to us. We'll have something on our website pretty soon at msnas.org, but um, come check it out and find out and pass it out so that we can start helping our community. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Marion Santos. I'm the owner of Santos Ford Toscano RV in Los Banos Chevron. Anyway, what I wanted to talk to the city council about is we sell all our vehicles. Dos Ballas buys all their vehicles for me. Fireball buys all their vehicles for me. Merced County bought over 40 Fords last year for me because I won the bid. The sheriff department bought over 25 vehicles from me, but yet the city of Los Banos, my hometown, where my mom was born here in 1920, and we're like third generation. My grandfather came over in 1885, and we need your support. But yet they seem to want to buy Chevrolets or GMCs or something else, and then if there's a warranty problem, they got to take two people out of town and then to go pick it up, they got to take two people. So that's costing the city more money. And all these vehicles are about the same. They all break down when they're stressful, no matter what kind of vehicle you got. I had a, a friend of mine that wanted to buy a Toyota. And so I took him to Merced Toyota. And there was 30 vehicles being worked on in there, transmissions out and different things. So they're all about the same, but we need your support. And, and uh, for us to stay in business, I did approximately $17.5 million in business last year at uh, Santa's Ford. And if we can't make it, we're going to close up. And uh, you guys are going to lose the sales tax revenue, you know. And it's been a struggle, believe me. I used to sell 80 cars a month, and I'm down to 20 to 25 cars. So it's been a real struggle. The Scano RV has been supporting Santa's Ford, or else it would have been closed up already. So we need all the support we could get, and I'd appreciate if you guys would look at that and try to buy locally. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Michelle with the executive, I'm the executive director for the Los Banos Chamber of Commerce. It's very nice to see all of you. Um, that I'm going to be taking over for a previous director that used to come and talk. Um, so I'll be trying to get here and do this. I, you all know that this isn't my favorite. I don't know how to do this very well, so bear with me again. Um, just a couple updates. Uh, the chamber hit um, after the holiday. We had a blackout and our servers crashed and we lost everything, and we've been trying to get up and running again since then. So we just got our um, system back up and running at the beginning of this week. So it's been a little crazy at the office, but we're still pushing on. We're still getting ready for all of our events, um, the Spring Street Fair, 
And we have partnered up with the Downtown Association to do um, the St. Patrick's Day pub crawl. So we are moving forward with that as well. Um, the street fair. We, um, we are continuing all of our events that we normally have a year, the spring street fair, fall street fair, the Halloween trunk or treat, and it's made a festival with the and the Christmas parade. We are not um, going to be having our Father's Day car show anymore um, for some reasons. We're not going to be doing that one. And um, we are in the process of figuring out what's going to happen. We might not be attending the um, Spring May Day Fair with our beer booth. So that's still kind of up in the air, hopefully. Um, yes. So we are always um, accepting new members, new directors. I am looking for a new director. So if you know anybody that would like to be a director, or if there's any business leaders here today that would like to be a director, please come speak with me. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council, and staff. Mary Bo Garcia uh, speaking on behalf of the Las Bianas Downtown Association. Um, actually, we're having our merchant event meeting tomorrow. Um, it's going to be um, at 530 Biggins Texas Barbecue, 609 I Street. Please be there. It's so important that the merchants do show up. I can't express how important it is. Uh, we really want to hear your uh, feedback. And um, overall, we want to see you there. And yes, overall, March 17th, St. Patrick's Pub Crawl. We're so excited to be partnering up with the Chamber of Commerce. And um, I did bring a flyer for you guys as well. The tickets are $30. You can get them at the Downtown Association. You could also get them um, at the Chamber of Commerce. And we um, on our website as well, you, we also have a square link on our flyer. We have 12 merchants actually participating, so we're so excited. We will be having live music. I Street will be shut down between 5th and 7th Street. So please come out and support, and um, all, we'll see you crawl away. <laughs> and overall, we um, really want to take a time to thank the staff for all your help and also count, uh, council for all your help. Um, thank you for all your support. And thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. And hope to see you March 17th. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Mayor, City Council, staff, members of the public, good evening. Uh, first off, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, announce a, uh, an event that's happening on Friday, March 29th, 2024. This is a welcome home to our Vietnam veterans. Uh, Vietnam era is from 1961 to 1975. As you well know, many of our veterans, the well, majority of our uh, veterans did not receive a good welcome home from their time uh, serving overseas. So this is a way for this organization, the Central Valley, Central California Veterans Organization, to continuously tell the veterans from this era, the Vietnam veterans, thank you and welcome home. Uh, this will be happening uh, over at the Veterans Pavilion Park, North Buhok Road, Atwater. Don't know how to pronounce that. Thank you very much. Uh, again, this is Friday, March 29th, 2024. This is a free event to all veterans, families, and general public. So hopefully, uh, if you're in the area, if you'd like to come by, show support, we really appreciate it. Uh, <sighs> folks, well, we've got a lot of problems here in town. Uh, we've had a lot of speakers here articulate some of the problems that they're having, um, and it all relates to uh, management. There's a serious problem with management, the relationship between management and those managed, and it's, and it's starting to affect, it's starting to spill over into people's lives, people's businesses, um, and to the city's future. I hope that you take this time to reflect upon the decisions you made, the decisions you have made, and the manner in which you've uh, discharged your duties. One of those is specifically having public input before you make a decision. The taxpayers are, are footing the bill. They should be part of the decision-making process at every step. I know it takes a long time. I know that you'd like to have a short meeting, but that's not the, how this our republic was designed. 
It was designed to have people participate in the decision-making process, ask questions, get responses, ask some more questions. I know you don't want to have a lot of meetings, but that's, that's how Republic was designed. Again, the, the issues with management, um, again, it's, it's, it's not necessarily the manager's fault, the city manager's fault. It's responsibility of the city uh, council. He's doing what he's allowed to do ostensibly, and it's city council's responsibility to direct uh, and to correct where necessary. Again, Mr. Panera has a lot of energy. He has a lot of drive. Um, but oh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Again, it's the city council's responsibility, and I hope you will take a more proactive approach to the issues affecting our city, our employees, and as I mentioned now, our business partners, which seem to be uh, getting cut out, out of the loop. I hope, again, that you uh, take this time to reflect upon how you've conducted yourselves, the decisions you made, and how you've made them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else in the public forum? Okay. All right, seeing none, I'll close the public forum. Move on to item seven, consideration of the approval of the consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda are as follows. Warrant numbers 243777 to 243-985 in the amount of $1,193,990.70. City Council Resolution Number 6741 to delegate authority to the City Manager to undertake certain actions to commence and complete the real property transactions for the Ortigolita Road slash Pioneer Road Intersection Improvement Project. City Council Resolution Number 6742 ratifying the City Manager's approval of the employment agreement with the Finance Director Vanessa Portillo. City Council Resolution Number 6743 accepting the 2023 street rehabilitation project as complete and authorizing the filing of a notice of completion with, with the Merced County Recorder, and the items are to be approved as submitted. All right, thank you. Do we have any items requested to be removed for discussion by council? Council Member Lewis. Thank you. Um, I'd like to pull item 7B as in boy, C as in Charles, and D as in David. All right, 7B, C, and D. Do I have anything else from any other members of the council? All right, so let's start with uh, 7B. For this, we'll go to Public Works Director, City Engineer Bergson. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, item... Uh, 7B is a authorization of the city manager to undertake uh, uh, certain actions to commence and complete the final property transactions for the uh, improvement to the intersection of Ortigalita and Pioneer Road, the intersection. This authorizes the uh, city manager to undertake all actions to commence and complete the real property transactions for um, Ortigalita and Pioneer. And we have sent letters out to all the uh, um, uh, contiguous property owners that will help the uh, intersection, widen the intersection and improve it. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, well, my first question would be, could you give us a little bit of history that leads up to why uh, this is going to be widened? Does it have anything to do with the widening of uh, Pioneer Road in total or, you know, historically, why is this happening? Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't have that much history. I just just recently uh, uh, got here. Uh, my understanding is it is part of the uh, project of widening Pioneer Road for an extended length. This is one part of it. And I think uh, other my complement members of staff may have uh, more knowledge of it. Okay. This is phase one of a, of a broader project to widen Pioneer. Okay, and in the discussion and analysis, um, there's a lot of terms like streamlining, streamlining and urgency. So um, how long has this been on the books to take care of, and, and why has it become urgent now? <coughs> yes, Madam Council Member. Um, 
to my understanding, um, the the urgency stems from um, some funds that are due to expire um, within possibly a two or three months. I don't know the prior history. However, um, the city is prepared um, to uh, backfill, so to speak, those funds as, as needed to proceed with the project. But it, um, it has taken some time. Uh, this is um, the state that it's at now, and I, I, that's the extent of my knowledge. But we still can proceed um, as planned. Uh, a portion of the funding is uh, subject to lapsing, so uh, that, that's um, the, prop, the uh, reason for the urgency. And I, and I can field some of this as part of MCAG uh, with Measure V, and that's something that the last two mayors have been working on as well, is this is part of the phasing project for that. But this is federal and state money, so it's not money coming from MCAG. So my question, but it is maybe part of the MCAG can plan. help you uh, answer this, as to whether or not, uh, how long has this money, have we had this money in possession? And, when, uh, and you said the expiration of this funding is within a couple of two or three months? So, so I think I can, I can help with this a, a little bit. So this, we, didn't, we don't have the funding in hand. So there's, there's STIP funds and HIP funds. SIP funds are state uh, transportation infrastructure program and HIP is the highway infrastructure program. So these were all allocated um, for regional activities in the 2021 uh, budget year. So these are all in conjunction with MCAG and MCAG is, is, is really the lead agency in, in terms of, of this regional project. And the reason why we state Measure V is because our large allocation for Measure V uh, on the discretionary side with the, with the MCAG board, forgive, forgive me if, if I'm saying something out of line, is, is substantial. And so this, um, this is the runway. So, so getting these right of ways is the runway in order to access these, these other funds. And these other funds will exist of federal funds like CMAC funds and several more discrete allocations for Measure V for the whole purpose of widening um, this Measure V project. This is, I think, the only regional project that Los Manos has uh, with MCAG. So the reason why this uh, took a little while is that this was teed up, I think, um, at the beginning uh, or towards the end of last year, and we had a little bit of turnover in terms of our public works department. So um, we just got back on it. Uh, Mark Thomas, our consultants, um, put put all of this together and, and this package together and presented it or we'll be presenting it to uh, to the property owners, and that will create the runway and an RFA for for the uh, um, accessing uh, these these STIP and HIP monies. They, they're they're not large allocations for this purpose, but once we are able to clear this hurdle, so to speak, it opens up the runway for uh, the finishing up of the RFA and the design side, working in through uh, Ortega Lita down that way as, as we work to um, work through the utility side of this because that, that's the first, the first piece of this. So that, that's, that's kind of a really quick history of this. Um, I, I can't say why it languished prior uh, to Chuck being here. Um, I think that that was um, another direction. So, but I, I do believe that um, there's, there's remedies to, to continue this and, and overcome the hurdle. As Chuck was saying, there's self-certification that, that can be done and some other things that aren't really necessarily reliant on Caltrans, but we were going through the Caltrans process because that STIP money um, is, is there in order to uh, pay for these right-of-ways. And, and it's, a, it's, it's a reimbursement uh, process, so we're not holding on to this cash at the moment. Well, there, there are phases of funding for the widening of Pioneer Road, and Correct. I know that uh, if it's not done uh, within the period of time, then that money goes back to MCAG slash state federal government, and they'll allocate it to some other project. So when is the expiration on this money? On, on, on the, the STIP money? Project, the STIP project. money is, is most likely going to expire uh, July, June or July, or September? June. Yes. 
Yeah, so, right, right. So is the state state set in the staff report, doesn't it? No, it does not. Yeah, so so Ape, so so we're we're bringing this, and the reason why there's a little truncated time on this is, is our our goal is to get this package to uh, by April in order to to access the the STIP funds. Now, once we have that and the RFA is 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 completed, then uh, the 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 smaller well the next allocation of of HIP, which is a, a federal. Um, will open up for that purpose, and that's re on the utilities. And, and I don't want to speak for the engineers and for the planners and everything like this. I'm I'm strictly giving you my knowledge from from the financing side of things. Uh, but yes, yeah, so but we have been meeting with MCAG and the executive director and uh, several times, and and the county uh, regarding this because some of it uh, encroaches on on, on county uh, sphere of influence. So we've been. We've been working with MCAG. MCAG is 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 cognizant of of these hurdles, and um, they're working with us in, in order to maintain our discrete funding with MCAG, which I think is currently at, at like eight or nine million. But that 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 will that will get larger as we go through the different phases of construction. Well, um, I you know I don't know where the blame lies. I know that this project uh, has was proposed by. Uh, this council, not this sitting council, but another sitting council uh, some time ago, and you're saying that MCH funded it in, in 21, and here we're, you know, in 2024, 20, and we're just now taking action on something because we're about to lose the money. And it, it's important to widen that Pioneer Corridor. We, we originally approved it to be a four-lane corridor, and then it came back to us without reason to cut it down to two lanes. Well, it's already a two lane road. So it looks like all we're gonna be doing is repaving a two lane road. And our highway is encumbered. 152 is encumbered with a lot of traffic. And the, the sole purpose of uh, bringing that around was a, a bypass to get traffic off of 152 and let trucks and traffic get from one side of town to continue east without uh, stopping through all the stoplights in, in, in our downtown area. So um, I, I hope we continue to move forward with this project in an appropriate manner, in a timely manner, and you know, not have a situation like this where we're squeezed on time and have to make a, a decision like this without looking at the, the total picture. I, I still haven't seen any mock-ups of what, what we're going to do on, on the Pioneer Corridor. Um, we, we had some renderings that were possibilities um, back when Mark Fachin was our public works director, but beyond that, I haven't seen anything. And um, I think it's time that we look at uh, not just the engineering, but uh, what, what is this project going to look like in the long run? Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm done with that one. All right. Let's move on to item 7C. For this, we'll go to City Manager Panera. Okay, well, we're asked to uh, approve this uh, selection tonight, but what I see in the report is generally what the skill level is uh, that's been requested of the employee, uh, the salary, and... Um, you know, the various benefits that are going to be given to uh, the employee. But uh, just as it was when we hired the, pub the new public works director, I I'd certainly like to have some information about this employee and know a little bit about her background and that you can share with us. Sure. Uh, myself and the team, we're excited to have Vanessa join us uh, here at the city of Los Panos. She has worked in city government for well over 10 years worked in multiple cities. She's worked in the city of Lathrop, worked for the county in Stanislaus, and worked for the uh, city of Livingston. She has gone through an extensive interview process with myself and the entire team, and uh, myself along with the entire team. We have just, uh, felt she'd be a good team member for us here at the city and be a good uh, partner for us and for the citizens of this town. So we're excited to have Vanessa join the team. And in those cities that you've mentioned, um, could you share with us what her job title was? Sure. She was finance manager roles and finance director roles. 
in all of those cities? Uh, finance manager in some one city, finance director in another city. Which city was she the finance director? In? Finance director in Livingston. Okay. Is the candidate here tonight? No. Was she invited to come? The candidate will, her first day of work is March 11th. Was she invited to I, come? I had asked her, I her first day of work is March 11th, so no, she was not. Was she asked to she come? She was not asked to come. I'm going to ask Council Member, why is that question relevant? He didn't answer the question. I'm, I'm asking you, why is that question relevant? Because it's important to me. Did you reach out and ask him that ahead of time? Because we can't read minds. If you, you wanted the candidate I, to be here, I think know, you would have. You know, Mr. Mayor, that this city manager will not communicate with me, so don't ever ask me that question again. Did you reach out to our city manager? That's my question to you. It, He's not going to talk. It's to a him. yes or no question. It's a no. I okay. didn't, and I'm not going to reach out to him because he's not going to communicate with me. So I would, you know, I would hope that the candidate would have been here tonight, to so that he can introduce her. Perfect. That's historically how we handle things. Uh, no, I understand that. What I'm saying is, did did you relay that that's your expectation? You're trying to make me look bad, and I've already shared with you that he does not communicate. Council member, I'm so not. No, I'm, I've answered that question. I, I'm merely so, stating if there's an expectation that that needs to be communicated. There's an expectation as a city council member that I should be treated like you, council member Jones, Begonia, and council member Ken Lambert, but I'm not. So there's your answer. Okay, I'm done with that one. Thank you. Thank you. Move on to 7D. Okay, um, my question on this one is when I read the report, um, There's, there's mention in the report about, uh, you know, Birch's rehab, but in the total packaging of the, all the streets that were named above, Overland, San Luis, B Street, Badger Flat, Cardoza, is there a reason why uh, Birch was not included in that? Because it was a complete project. Mr. Um, Mr. Mayor, members of council, um, I I don't know why uh, Birch was not included. Birch was part of the uh, the project. It it was a change order. Yeah, it was in the change order number five. I I do recall looking at earlier um, council reports in December. Change order five did include Birch uh, Birch Street. So is because it was a change order, is it going to be added in as part of what is going to be submitted to Merced County as completion of roads, roads that have been completed yes. for rehab? Yes. Okay. I know that it wasn't in the original bid, and certainly I had concerns about that and, and brought it to the attention of our council. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that that was clear. It, it was clear since that wasn't in uh, the what four or five streets that were mentioned. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, the staff has pointed out in the notice of completion, Birch Avenue is listed. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. All right. Do we want to vote on uh, have a motion to vote on the consent agenda? Council Member Lambert. Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as now has been read. Thank you. Council Member Jones. I'll second that. All right. Can we do a roll call vote, please? Yes. All right. Thank you. Let's move on to item eight, Peninsula Clean Energy presentation. This will go to Community and Economic Director Suzanne. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have the privilege of introducing Sean Marshall. She is the Chief Executive Officer of Peninsula Clean Energy, and she is going to give you a presentation tonight on some updates and some information about Peninsula Clean Energy. Take it away, Sean. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I appreciate the invitation to come and provide an update on the activities of Peninsula Clean Energy and the benefits that we are bringing to your residents and businesses here in the city of Los Banos. Um, I'm going to be as brief as I can, but feel free to stop and ask any questions if need be. Um, so I want to just start off by uh, introducing my colleagues who are here. We have Mark Hirschman, I think many of you have met. Mark is our Director of Government Affairs. And we have Vidi Renteria, who is our new Community Outreach Specialist based here in Los Banos. I also want to acknowledge you, Mayor um, Paul Giannis, for your great leadership on our board of directors. We really appreciate that. I do want to also recognize Josh Panero for engaging with us and figuring out how to leverage the programs we have for the benefit of your community. And last but not least, I really do want to uh, recognize Stacy Elms, who when we met was Stacy Souza. And um, without her, I don't believe I would be standing here giving this presentation. And um, do appreciate your ongoing liaison to our staff to make sure that things continue to remain on track. I'm going to show a brief video and then run through, you know, four or five slides and, and be done. Um, but the, the very first thing that I want to start out with here tonight is to um, reassure you that providing affordable rates is priority one for us right now. Uh, we have a name called Peninsula Clean Energy. We live by that. That is um, the you know, the fabric of who we are, but we are well aware of the uh, skyrocketing energy costs and we are doing our part to offer as deep a savings as we can to all of our customers here and in San Mateo County. The good news is that Peninsula Clean Energy knows how to do many things well. So that means that we are able to go back and redouble our efforts to lower our rates while also continuing to provide clean energy and meet all of our decarbonization goals that are important to the state of California. So with that, I want to roll video, Stacey, if you wouldn't mind, and then I'll come back and we'll do some highlights and I'll Peninsula be done. Peninsula Clean Energy was founded in 2016 with a clear goal, to provide clean energy, lower rates, and to combat climate change. As a nonprofit energy provider, I'm proud to say that we've managed to slash emissions by 94% while at the same time increasing renewables and maintaining electric generation rates at a minimum 5% below PG&E. That's over $100 million back to our customers and our community since 2016. In the past year, we've secured our largest wind contract to date, adding over 200 megawatts of clean energy into our resource portfolio. In 2024, we expect to bring online five new projects, adding over 300 megawatts of new capacity onto the grid. This will get us within striking distance of meeting our 100% renewable goal. Peninsula Clean Energy is showing that we don't have to make a choice between affordable rates and cleaner energy. We don't have to satisfy corporate shareholders. Our customers are our shareholders. Peninsula Clean Energy was started to combat climate change, but now it's so much more. The true value of community choice is that it's local. It means going to your street fair and seeing us at a booth and asking a question about your energy bill. It's also when you go to plug in your EV and seeing a charger provided by Peninsula Clean Energy. Peninsula Clean Energy serves all of our customers in our community with different language outreach and programs for all income levels. A lot of the programs that come from Peninsula Clean Energy help our communities to take part because many times the communities that we serve are left out with the policies that comes down to address climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. We're helping the community install thousands of chargers, including our hard to reach places like apartment buildings. So with Peninsula Clean Energy's EV Ready program, this has been so affordable. We're at 29 outlets installed and the cost has been basically nothing. And for mom and pop housing providers, that's really, really important to us because we don't have a lot of capital to spend. The average charger in our program is being installed for about $4,000, much less than the average of ten dollars to $18,000 in other programs. We are your local partner in building a sustainable community. 
Peninsula Clean Energy remains steadfast in our commitment to power our communities, combat climate change, and provide affordable clean energy to the customers we proudly serve. Okay, thank you so much for watching that. Now we'll shift into the slides. Let's see. Peninsula Clean Energy nope. was founded in 2016. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much. Let's make sure that works here. Yep. Okay. All righty. So um, I mentioned at the top of the meeting that um, affordable rates is our number one priority. And I do want to say that we have heard our customers loud and clear. And so um, what we have been able to do, uh, first time ever, and Marianas did cast his vote as well, is that we have frozen our rates at 2023 levels. Unfortunately, we do not have anything to say about what PG&E does with its own rates. You might recall that our piece of it is just the electric generation portion, um, but it still can add up. And so we are now, uh, especially here in Los Banos, anywhere between 10 and 18% lower than uh, if a customer was receiving electric generation from PG&E. And that is a significant savings that we actually hope to continue um, through hopefully the remainder of this year. Uh, we are also looking at our rate design to more closely match our rate setting with our cost to serve. And there will be more on that, Marianos, at a, um, our next board meeting, actually. We also support home electrification. And one of our most popular programs, and one that I want to make sure everybody in the community is aware of, is our uh, $10,000 0% down loan. It is a 0% interest rate, excuse me. It is simple. It's one page. There's no credit check. Uh, it is a 10-year payback period, and anyone who is a Peninsula Clean uh, Energy customer um, can receive one of these loans. They've been hugely popular. What they're used for is any kind of a energy-related retrofit on your home uh, that would replace fossil fuel with, for example, heat pump water heater, heat pump HVAC, and the like. The program has taken off. We've issued um, well over 400 loans just in one year, and we're allocating additional budget to it. Next up, PCE supports the transition to clean transportation. We do this through a number of programs, and one thing I want to call out that was in the video is um, we are supporting a number of multifamily um, existing apartment buildings to put in clean energy charging at an affordable rate and, and in many cases almost zero cost. And there are um, customers that we have, many of whom may be economically disadvantaged in renting, uh, and that is a way to, to serve a market that has been uh, generally underserved so far. We also have a very popular EV rebate, e-bikes open to all customers. Um, one thing that will be important to you, or uh, many things, but um, we have a number of programs to partner with our local governments um, in the areas of advancing um, climate action plans. If you have these, we have a government um, GovPV program, which uh, the city of Los Banos is very involved in. You have a, um, two projects actually forthcoming. One is a carport on your community center, and the other is a solar project at your wastewater treatment plant. We're hoping to break ground on those very soon. Um, and those will be saving you millions of dollars over the course of a 20-year time span. Um, we also have a couple of new funding opportunities. Um, one is our local government electrification program. Those are grants and loans available to our local government members to do uh, energy-related retrofits. We also have a new member agency energy grant program that allocated a certain amount of grant money to each of our member jurisdictions based on the size of your load and customers. So I do want to um, acknowledge that Moises Lomeli uh, in, I believe, your buildings department um, did attend a briefing that we had, and the money allocated for Los Banos is $422,000. Uh, there is an application process, and I know you'll be moving forward on that soon. And then just to wrap up here pretty quickly, um, a number of Los Banos highlights. Hopefully you got the letter that we sent through that also articulated some of these stats. Um, but I think it's important to know that you guys have about 14,000 customers currently served by PCE. 
with about a 90% participation rate. Uh, and that represents about 5% of our overall load. Since 2022, when we went live with the city of Las Banas, your constituents have saved over $3.2 million on their utility bills. And that is just the electric generation portion, just to remind you. But at the end of the day, that is money back in their pockets to spend in a different way. Um, this does include a recent $300 rebate that we offered to our CareFair customers. That is an income qualified program. There were rebate um, credits on the customer's bill in December and January of this year. Um, and that also, I do want to acknowledge your mayor for uh, really leading on that effort in the last several months. I mentioned already the two solar projects that we have underway here in town. And uh, I also want to say that we have, uh, your residents have availed themselves of a little bit over 600000 in various loans, rebates, and et cetera that I have um, already discussed. So coming forward in this year, um, we did just uh, issue a, a community reinvestment package of $68 million that allocates funding across a number of programs, including the local government funding. We have um, enhanced programs to make electrification of homes and transportation easier and more affordable for our customers. We are pushing to shift to 100% clean energy and remain at deeply discounted rates. So that would not be at an extra charge. And we have now shifted into really looking at everything we do through the eyes of our customers and what our customers need first. So with that, I will wrap up, say thank you from our team to yours. It's been delightful to work with you and here to take any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Do I have any questions from Council? Council Member Lewis. Thank you. Uh, yes, you mentioned that um, there are two solar projects that you're working with. Could you address those and uh, let our community know what those projects are and when they will be going forward? Yes. So there's, they are Peninsula Clean Energy owned generation projects. We, um, your council approved the power purchase agreements, the contracts for those, I think in the fall of last year, but I can find out exactly what date it was. So thank you for that. And um, there's a carport that's going to be installed at your community center with solar panels on top of that carport. And then there's going to be a ground mount solar rooftop uh, at your wastewater treatment plant. That is make, those projects right now are making their way through both your public works department and PG&E. Uh, PG&E is required to actually um, go live on those projects. So we're hoping that those will actually be, we'll do a ribbon cutting and those will be done sometime this year. Okay, but um, there's, there's uh, no date or time frame for the ribbon cutting for those two. I wish I had one for you, but it's just sort of contingent upon other agencies, not our own. Okay. But we will certainly keep the mayor and city manager updated on that. All right. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from council? No. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. All right, let's move on to item nine, consideration of adoption of ordinance number 1204, amending title two, chapter two, article five, section 2-2.510 of the Los Banas Municipal Code to change the meeting dates and times of the Los Banas Airport Advisory Commission from monthly meetings to quarterly meetings. This will be the second reading and adoption. For this, we'll go to our public works director, city engineer, Bergson. And Mr. Mayor, members of council, this is the second reading of the um, ordinance from last meeting of uh, changing the airport meeting, airport um, advisory commission meetings from um, once a month to once a quarter. All right. Any questions from council? Do I have a motion? Do I have a motion? Council Member Jones. All right, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to waive the second reading of ordinance number 1204 as read by title. Thank you. Council Member Lambert. I'll second. All right. Sorry, Council Member Begonia, he beat you. All right. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. And then I'm looking for a motion to adopt 
Councilmember Jones. Yes, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to adopt ordinance number 1204 as read by title. All right, thank you. Do I have a second? Councilmember Begonia. Second. All right, all those in favor? Oh, roll call. got me. All right, roll call vote, please. Begonia? Yes. Jones? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Yanez? Yes. All right, motion passes. Thank you. Let's move on to item 10. Consideration of City Council Resolution 6744, adopting a revised budget for the 23-24 fiscal year as it pertains to expenditures and revenue. For this, we'll go to Interim Finance Director Kuhn. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. City Manager. So um, this review uh, is really to take um, a little bit of, of time to pause and see if our assumptions that we made uh, at the beginning of the year for uh, the, the general budget um, um, was was accurate, how close, whether or not the estimated the estimates have changed. Um, our our approved budget was predicated a, a, a little bit on some austerity, not really knowing what the economic future was going to hold, whether or not there was a recession at hand or, or what. So as I went through this and um, I looked at the, all of the accounts, every single line item, um, a trend started developing. Um, first, um, let's explain. This is a time we can um, take an in-depth look kind of at, at, at the financial position. Um, mostly we focus on the general fund because that's the discretionary fund of, of the council. Um, and we, we review um, our financial statements, our general ledger to see uh, if, if our spending is in line with uh, the appropriations that were approved or whether or not um, there was things that took place, whether it be price pressures uh, on certain items within that uh, account string that we have to change uh, said um, um, a, um, adjustments or said um, um, accounts, sorry. Um, and those those accounts are, are, uh, are usually predicated on certain assumptions and those mid-year adjustments uh, for all the city funds um, are represented in uh, Exhibit A of the uh, staff report. So as, as we, we went through the estimates that, um, that were generated, um, we're really, again, focused on the general fund and really just focused on the general fund's major revenues. And those major revenues, of course, are sales tax, property tax, property tax in lieu of vehicle, uh, um, vehicle licensing fees, permits, and interest. And, and usually we in include um, just all cost of money or, or all uh, assets that generate uh, income, that being land or, or rentals or, or otherwise. But we do, have, we do have a line item with that, but that one is, is pretty static and, and doesn't change. So these were the, the areas that were sensitive to uh, any um, estimates that we made at the beginning of the year. So I'll take a second to kind of go through that. And for sales tax, we budgeted um, almost 60, uh, 6.8 million. Um, as I'm looking through the sales tax remittances through the first part of the year and projecting that out, uh, those projections look more like um, close to $7 million, so 6.97. So we're projecting a, a, a surplus or, or being over budget on that revenue of, of close to 200000 Property taxes are the most surprising for me, um, and one of the reasons why this mid-year review um, happens at this time of year is because we're always waiting on that first remittance from uh, from the county. Uh, and it came back very, very positive um, uh, for the first remittance. It was it was much greater than the, the previous year. And I've projected out, uh, again, that to be, well, we budgeted uh, $6.38 million and projecting that out to close to $7 million. And that surplus is, is uh, close to $650,000. Property tax in, in lieu of vehicle, uh, again, there's the, the old triple flip of, of this monies um, and the stuff that we did with the state. That, that one generated $265,000 of surplus, and we received that remittance twice a year. 
permits was a very surprising one and and it also um, generated uh, part of I think the majority of the dollar amount of of our amendments to the mid-year budget and that was um, that um, as of of the date as of today um, we, we budgeted fifty um, thousand dollars I'm five hundred thousand dollars excuse me and and we have over a million dollars in permits that we've received and then interest and then interest has been more of, of a uh, change in direction of management and finance to try to leverage our our assets so so basically our cash on hand um, when I first got in here a uh, majority of the cash was was deposited in checking making no money and now we've we've gone and and we've really taken advantage of of the the inverse relationship of the yield curve so that means that short-term financing is getting higher yields than long-term financing so it's actually been very beneficial so we we have we've uh, um, to the extent of of not jeopardizing liquidity to the city, we've we've put a lot of these investments in these short term investments, and and that's generated a considerable surplus of you know um, close and it might be greater depending on on how interest rates play out the remainder of the year, but it could be between eight fifty and a million dollars. So so it's been very strong in terms of of, of those areas. So. Um, Within the general fund, the expenditure side and the cost um, you know, uh, is very important. And of course, the appropriations that are approved by by that, we manage that, and, and we are very, very cognizant of of keeping costs down and and utilizing um, anything that we can to get economies of scale or, and whatnot there. So as we go through the major functions of the city, uh, the administration side, we had. A uh, budget of 2.5 million right now. Um, as of <coughs> January, the end of January, we have almost a million, and we projected that out. So that major city function is is currently under budget, uh, considerably under budget. Uh, community and economic development, building and engineering. Um, oh, sorry, I'm I'm, I'm reading it. Thank, you, appreciate it. Uh, so that's kind of all com uh, combined together. And again, those functions are are sensitive predicated on uh, technical services that, that are attached to the permit revenue. But as you can see, um, the, we budgeted about 4.3 million there. Currently it's it's just under two and I'm projecting that out to be about 3.4 million. So again, um, under budget. Uh, safety, which includes police, fire, code enforcement, uh, dispatch, um, we budgeted about 16 million. Right now, it's at 9.2. I'm projecting that out to just under 16. That's closer to being right on budget, but but still predict, uh, projecting to be under. Uh, recreation and maintenance. Is, uh, we combine those two together because their functions um, deal with a, a lot of the parks within the city. Uh, that that doesn't really have a whole lot of sensitivity in terms of of, of savings. Those those are fixed. A lot of those are fixed fixed costs. And uh, so we, we budgeted 2.7. Uh, right now we're at about 1.5, and we're projecting out to just under that 2.7 at 2.66. So the total fund expenditures um, on the general government side, general fund, we budgeted about 25.5 million. We are currently at 13.6, and we're projecting that out to be substantially under budget. Um, and, and again, some of these. Uh, Items were relating to one-time uh, cost uh, items that have not yet been done, so that could increase. Uh, but most likely, with the assumptions that I've built into this, I I, I highly anticipate that those uh, expenditures are, are going to be under twenty-four million dollars. So, um, thank you. Um, on the revenue side. Um, the budgeted revenues is about 23 million uh, in the general fund, and um, the projected increases to revenues, I've, 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 uh, again um, tempered some of the areas that we haven't received any any revenue yet, and so it was difficult to project those out. So I, this is a very conservative estimate of close to uh, 1.5 million over that budget. So we we we're projecting to be uh, over budget or create a surplus. Uh, and that brings us to about 24.6 million, uh, and the projected expenditures and transfers is about 
6.4. So we're, we're projecting very conservatively that again, we're going to have an operating uh, surplus as we've, we've carried the last uh, couple of years now. So um, the, the, the news has been, was, was quite encouraging and I, I, I wasn't as confident as this until I got the property tax revenue remittance and then everything kind of came uh, around. So now on the cash and investment side of things, I just I wanted to give more of a citywide approach to this because in some cases, some of the funds like the, the police construction funds, which we were still burning cash for the police department in the tune of about six million this year. Um, since the beginning of the year, we've increased our cash and investments uh, in city uh, citywide uh, over a million dollars. So, so even with the, that kind of, of of spending that we have done, and we've done some other uh, you know overlay projects, and we've done and we're working on the wastewater treatment. So there's been there's been some some big ticket items, and and we're still uh, in a cash position that that was actually quite surprising. So. Um, Good job on on all the departments in terms of of really uh, managing their costs the way they have been. So, on um, Exhibit A, uh, there's a, a a listing of uh, of adjustments, and most of these adjustments are are really true ups in terms of of where I I would I would went through every single account string and picked out an assumption parameter of, of a percentage left that, that I felt comfortable what, there would be no, no overages. Now, from, from, a, from, from a total appropriation standpoint, we're golden, I, I, but, but in terms of, of how I feel about appropriations and line items, I, I thought it would be best to address those line items that could have some difficulty uh, at the end of the year. So um, I'm happy to go through each line item if you wish, but what I really wanted to do is, is just highlight the big ticket items. So um, in the general fund, um, the big increase was 375 uh, grand, and that was an increase in appropriations for basically in the building side of things in the CSG contracts, it's tied to permit revenue. So those permit revenues increase their uh, it doesn't increase commensurate with that because there's there's a percentage uh, that's relating to this, but we still had to make sure that on the appropriation side we could pay their bills, even though uh, it's it, it, it's a net gain to to the city in regards to to this activity. Uh, we wanted to increase appropriations on the Nora Jones sidewalk improvements because um, our, our great, uh, wonderful, up and coming golden child of, of uh, public parks and rec directors so thinks that that needs to, you know, be be done. So uh, I, I believe I, I, I believe in Noah that 100 percent. And so, uh, and then early on in in the year, the water fund we had. Um, about two hundred thousand dollars because we were, were test drilling uh, for well number sixteen. It kind of didn't turn out the way we wanted to, but there was a con there was a subcontractor cost that was relating to that. That that the the former public works director ran through a task order, and it really wasn't an on call thing. So I wanted to bring that to this mid year to make sure that you know everything was was, was okay there. Um, and then on the waste uh, wastewater side, um, there was seventy thousand uh, dollar increase in appropriations for wastewater treatment pre treatment program assessment. So and, and that was was given to me by the Public Works Department. Um, apparently, that is something that that is needed before the end of the year. Um, I'm happy to go through any and all of these one by one if you wish, but for the sake of time and everybody's. Um, attention span, um, I'll, I'll take your questions and we can go from there. All right, questions from council. Council Member Lewis. Thank you. Uh, could you explain to me what the um, Nora Jones sidewalk improvement plan is and where is it located? Uh, it's just a, a typo, it's Officer Noah Jones ballpark there at 7th Street. Um, it's the park there Noah. next. Yeah, just south of uh, the fire station number one there on 7th Street. Um, and the project there um, we'll hopefully be bringing to council here in the next couple of council meetings uh, as far as the, the bid uh, pr approval award of, of that uh, construction project. The project itself, 
um, will include a U-shaped sidewalk, which will complete a full loop around the, the ballpark. Uh, as, as you're probably aware, there's the four ball fields there. Um, there's currently a sidewalk on the south side of the uh, the um, uh, ballpark that allows access along the bathroom and that, that south side of the ballpark. But we're trying to connect to provide ADA um, compliance throughout the park. Um, as well, there'll be a small fence that runs along, a three-foot fence that runs along the parking lot to prevent children from running into the parking lot between games. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I'll I'll just say it. That this is outstanding news, right? I mean, the amount of money that we've spent to do things and the amount of improvements that we're seeing citywide, and then to tell us at the end of the day that you're actually making money while do this. I mean, this is yeah, this is outstanding news. So so thank you for that. You're welcome. All right. Sure, Council Member Lewis. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know, I, um, I think under our uh, ordinance for the city of Los Banos that uh, we're required to have 30% uh, yes. of our expenditures on an annual basis in reserve. Are we still, are we yes. still at that? Yes, yeah, so, so uh, you recall I came to the council and committed uh, funds for the DSC, and, and even with the committed funds and, and what I project out to this, uh, we're, st we're still going to be uh, upwards in, in the 80, 90 percent um, of, of next, next year's appropriated expenditures of fund equity position. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I understand there's no uh, no action to be taken on this item. Just information. Oh, uh, yeah, I think there's a resolution. Oh, well, Council Member Jones. Uh, Frank Kuhn, got a question. Uh, prior years, what would be our estimated reserves that we'd have as far as percentage-wise? So um, we're, we're close to 89. Well, so, higher or have we been lower well so, so before I committed those funds, um, and, it, and if I hadn't um, for that purpose, we would be pushing close to 130, 140%. It, it, it's still stronger than, and it's, again, the 30% the is, is for unrestricted. So, so even within uh, the unrestricted uh, portion, it, we are very, very strong. So to compare it to last year, I would say it's it, it, as far as if I were to include that commitment from into last year, we will be better this year. Does that so, make sense? So, so looking back a few years, we've been progressing better. Yeah, well, the, so here, herein lies the greatest problem of government, right, is that you're, you're making money, but yet you should be spending it because it's for the service of the community, right, not to sit and, you know, have like a big Stare portfolio. At. So, yeah, my, my goal would be that we got closer to that 30% than where we are now and, you know, allow things to happen for, for, for the community. I don't know if that answering your no, question. No, that's the question. It sounds like we're very healthy. Yes. So it's, yes. It we're, contradicts some of the stuff that's been out there and uh, it's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. I only, I only live in, in the GL world and, and the real world here. So I don't, uh, I can't, I can't make comment on no, that. Perfect. All right. Thank you. All right. Do I have a, a motion on this resolution? Council member Lambert. Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion to uh, uh, accept resolution number 6744 as read. All right, thank you. Do I have a second? Council Member Gonia. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes. Thank you. Move on to item 11, advisement of public notices. I understand we have two reports. Go to Community Economic Development Director Ems. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the first item is to consider a revision to a previously approved site plan. Uh, the proposed project is located on the northeast corner of Ward Road and Pacheco Boulevard. Um, this is for legacy development and um, their project consists of a fuel station and convenience store. Um, and there's a revision to their site plan that they're requesting. The second is for mobile food vendor Hugo Oliveira Cortez doing business as Oliveira's Pan Dulce Mexicano. Um, this mobile food vending unit would be um, operating within the public right of way. Uh, both of these public hearings will be held on Wednesday, March 13th at 6 p.m. here in the council chambers. And that concludes my report. All right. Thank you for that. Move on to item 12, city manager report. 
Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. Um, first, just want to say thank you to uh, all the team members of the city staff that helped out at Arbor Day. It was a great event. Uh, thank you so much, Joe Heim, you and your team, and all the participants throughout uh, the city that went and helped out and showed up. It was a really nice event to be able to out there and plant some trees. It was over there at Talbot Park near the junior high. It was very well attended. Uh, we were blessed that it did not rain extensively, uh, so it, maybe some light sprinkles of the sort, but we were able to get through it. Uh, so uh, thank you for all that. Uh, Esmeralda Soria was able to uh, join us there, so that was nice of her for her to come and uh, be a part of that event. It's always nice to uh, take part in those, so that's good. Um, also on March 30th, I'd like to let everybody know we have our egg hunt at Oliveira Park. Uh, if you haven't been to that, that's a pretty fun event. Um, you get a lot of uh, kids out there that like to have fun and a lot of games, uh, bounce houses, so on and so forth. So I want to make sure folks are aware of that, and hopefully we have good weather for that day. Uh, so that'll be uh, really good. Um, right now, as we speak, the community center is getting painted. Uh, that is extremely exciting for us. Um, that building, I think, was built around 2008, I believe, 2009. And so it um, hasn't been painted since then. And if you go and take a look at it, you can see the stark contrast in the uh, colors of the new paint to the old paint. So we're really excited about that project being done. Um, over the last couple of weeks or so, we've been doing quite a bit of tree trimming again um, in areas where trees have just not been trimmed at all. So they're trimming trees all along the uh, canal trail all up and down there. Um, a lot of trees are getting trimmed, so it's really helping for that. Uh, a lot of trees around the fairgrounds are getting done. Some trees on K Street, J Street, I believe, somewhere around there, L Street, uh, no, J and K, uh, exactly. So quite a bit of uh, tree work is being done there. So really excited with all the work that's being done. As uh, uh, Joe High mentioned, we're working on some uh, uh, sidewalk uh, walkway path at the uh, Powell Ball Field, so really excited about that. So um, quite a bit of projects that are just continuing to take place. So um, look forward to those good works and uh, some of the, and also just continue to look forward to engage with the different uh, uh, businesses and people here to uh, continue to resolve and uh, work on um, issues that need to be taken care of here in the city. And I know staff has continued to have those conversations and um, legal teams continue to have those conversations and uh, we're, we're, we're working diligently to uh, continue to try to make progress. Thank you. All right. Move on to item 13, report update, Merced County Association of Governments, MCAG Peninsula Clean Energy, PCE, Measure V Committee, and San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District, and the Los Banos Downtown Property and Business Improvement District. And we'll start with uh, the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution. Councilmember Lewis. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'd like to report to the community that on March 2nd, the San Joaquin Air Pollution Control District um, sponsored uh, with uh, Valley Can, a uh, tune-up event uh, at the fairgrounds. And despite the fact that we had heavy rains that morning, we had a, a really good turnout uh, from the one that we had two years ago. There were 258 cars that uh, went through the line. Of those 258, there were 40, uh, 243 vehicles that were issued vouchers. And this is around people who, whose cars cannot pass smog. And so the vouchers um, are valued up to $500 to help them uh, do any repairs on their vehicles to help them pass smog. Um, of those vehicles that went through, we had an 83.61% uh, that did not pass smog, so that were not able to pass smog. So it tells you, um, uh, you know, in our community, there, there are a lot of people who can't afford to get their cars fixed. And um, uh, we have this money that comes down from the state to assist them. And it is um, income driven. So um, I was happy to see that with all these vehicles that um, there, there were a lot of vouchers given out uh, to help uh, the community uh, repair their vehicles and pass fog. Uh, there were, uh, of, of the cars that passed, it was 16.39% pass that passed smog. Um, so that's a low rate. Uh, hopefully as time goes on, that will change. Um, there's also a funding allocation available through San Joaquin um, Air uh, Pollution Control District. Uh, and it's also income driven uh, for people to help purchase new vehicles. And this, th these would be electrical vehicles, electric vehicles. Um, let's see here. 
of, of the people who are interested in replacing their vehicles, uh, looks like my, my uh, printer did a little smudge here. Uh, I think there were 58 contacts. 40 people said yes, and 12 people were not interested, and six people did not complete their paperwork properly. Uh, there were 55 people who uh, test drove vehicles, and I was surprised and told that there was even a Tesla out there. So um, there, there was quite a bit of interest in people who uh, wanted to tra uh, transition from combustion vehicles to um, electric. Um, also, for the replacement vehicles, um, the eligibility is for vehicles that are 2006 and older. So uh, those people who have vehicles that are 2006, going back, older vehicles, uh, they would be eligible income base to apply for the, the um, grant to purchase a new vehicle. So uh, that's it on the Air Pollution Control Board. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. We'll move on to... Okay. Uh, only thing we had a report tonight from PCE. Uh, only thing I have is uh, with MCAG, we are getting ready to do um, the One Voice project um, where we'd be going to Washington, D.C. to represent the city of Los Banos, um, you know, based on our, our federal wants and needs and things that will better our community. So we're getting ready to, to gear for that trip up in May. So that's all I have for, for MCAG. Move on to uh, item 14, city council member reports. Council member Lambert. Start with you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I have, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have. We can start with Doug if you want, but I have. Oh, Council Member Lambert. I uh, appreciate it, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Mr. Kuhn, a great report, you know, and, and all the department heads that put all that together. Uh, you know, it, it's always nice to see that even just quarterly through the year, you know, we're improving. Uh, there's not a lot. You know, I, I'm excited uh, to meet the new finance uh, lady once she gets here. Uh, you know, I do understand that, you know, uh, we're not a part of the hiring uh, decision on that. But, you know, I'm sure our department head, city manager, do uh, one heck of a job on the hiring process and that. And I look for, forward to meeting her possibly on the next meeting. So and that's all I have to say. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you. Councilmember Begonia. Um, I had a, two Saturdays ago, I got to go out to the fire department and have a breakfast with the fire um, department. And um, it's glad to see all the people of the community going out and supporting our uh, wonderful fire department, all the men and women that make uh, our, keep our community safe. And then uh, last Friday was at the Arbor Day celebrations, which was fantastic. Um, Joe and his team and all um, employees of the city that work outside and in, in, in this wind and have successful events and have to deal with this Los Banos wind uh, um, and, and manage to uh, always do great things out there. We, re we appreciate that as a community. Um, great work, Brent, on the report tonight. And that's it. All right. Council Member Jones. Yes, Mayor. I'd like to just thank staff for all their hard work lately. I know you guys have put in long days and extra hours, and it's just greatly appreciated. Without you guys, um, the city would not be running as efficiently as what it does, and we would not be getting these much needed improvements and upgrades that we've been getting. And so from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys. Um, I, I really mean that, that we really appreciate everything you guys do for us, so thank you. All right, Council Member Lewis. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'd just like to say I'm looking forward to the Oliveira Park Easter event. Uh, it's in my district, and, um, you know, the kids really enjoy themselves. And, Joe, you know, when you put out those suds and they, they love to run through that, I think last year we had a little bit of issue where the wind was up and it, it caused a bit of problem, but the kids still enjoy that. And their rush for the candy, oh, my goodness. I think when parents get them home, they're on a real high uh, after eating all the candy that's thrown out there. So it's, it's a really fun event. 
Uh, so thank you for putting that on and, and making sure that, that our youth and our kids have something to do around that time. Um, I'm not sure who to pose this question to, um, but um, in the city manager's contract under performance evaluation, uh, there's a clause that says the city shall review and evaluate the performance of the employee annually on or about February 21st of each year for the term of the contract. And I'm not sure how that slipped through this year and what happened as to why we didn't have the evaluation. Uh, that's a good question, but we'll ensure it comes up. Well, it was due on or about February 21st, so we're into March now. I mean... Um, is the city, and maybe uh, Mr. Vaughn can answer this, is the city manager supposed to no, notify the uh, HR director or how does this work? Um, just briefly, that's a function of the city council to do that evaluation. It's not the HR director's. Uh... No, I didn't, I didn't say her function. I'm saying who is supposed to notify to put it on the agenda so that, that the, this moves forward. Historically, it's been on the agenda, and it's been a closed session item, but for some reason, we haven't done it this year. I would say that it would be the city manager's responsibility to, she, he's responsible for the agenda, um, to get it onto the agenda. Okay. So I would like to make a request that um, we move forward to put this on the agenda as soon as possible. That's it. Thank you. Pushing, pushing all sorts of buttons up here. All right. Um, so I'll go last. Um, I'll make this brief. You know, one thing just, I'll tell you just that I learned in this meeting tonight is the effective ways of communication. You know, good, bad, or ugly, we got to talk to each other. We have to set. And the people that sit up on this dais, our job is to actually create the expectations. Um, and I know that that's something that, again, we represent 40 plus thousand people. So the workflow is the citizens give their expectations to us. We then give it to right city staff through the city manager, and that's the workflow that, that we need to do to be successful. Um, just hearing some things tonight that we're obviously not doing that. Um, and again, I've, I've mentioned this before to Councilmember Lewis, if our city manager will not communicate with her, if there's dialogue that's not happening, I need to know about it. Because again, that's part of the effective role is we have to communicate with each other or we're not gonna get you know, things done. I'm super encouraged that what I'm hearing financially, and I 100% agree that yes, our job is not to build a giant savings account, it's to benefit the citizens of Los Manis. So when a taxpayer spends money, they give it to us, we need to, again, give it back to them in, in the form of, of a service. So the other thing is, you know, comments from the last two meetings uh, regarding Mr. Hostetler and things with Stonefield. Um, I can confirm with you that, that we've had multiple conversations. I have personally have conversations with, with Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Hostel, in fact, I had a 30-minute phone conversation with him two days ago. Um, so there is dialogue in place. And again, it does come down to communication. There's not a good guy. There's not a bad guy. We just need to communicate more. We need to be more effective. Um, but I will say this, the decisions, and I won't speak for any other members of council, the decisions that I make are in for the benefit of 40-plus thousand people, not for a single business owner or developer. That's just not what I'm going to do. It's not what I was elected to do. Um, so again, I know that there's conversations going on. Um, and, and again, we've discussed having a meeting. I'd have that meeting tomorrow if we want to do it. And if we can, we can resolve the, the issues, whatever they may be, whatever we're responsible for, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's get it over with. Let's move on to the next thing. Um, that's, that's kind of my take. And the other thing is I do want to communicate to both our city manager and to our city attorney that um, I am tired of waiting for the state to, to fix our homeless issue. I think it's time to go to plan B. I think plan B needs to start like right now. Um, you know, we did have an incident behind the trail recently, a violent crime was committed. And so I think now the priority we do need to shift. Um, and maybe that's something for, for a future agenda is, is plan B needs to happen now. We need to stop waiting for the state, uh, to come in and, and save the day. We need to do it ourselves at this point. So that's, that's my take on that. Um, with that, I'll look for a, a motion to adjourn. Council member Jones. So All right. Do you have a second? Council member Lambert. Second. All right. Mm, meeting adjourned 743. Thank you.